How's it going? And uh, this morning is our, our first ever breakfast session uh, online. We've done it in Edinburgh quite a few times, and actually just before the uh, the lockdown hit, we had invites out and location set and everything for to do it in London, um, and then it didn't happen. So this is the first time we're doing it online, and we've already doubled the amount of people that we uh, we usually get registered. So thanks very much. And um, I'd like to start by uh, uh, introducing Abhishek. Say hello, Abhishek. Hi there. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> Um, Abhishek has been with Dropbox for five years. He's touched many parts of the business from product strategy and roadmap and uh, vision. Uh, more recently, he's been uh, leading the, uh, the, key, the key client partnerships. And this is really great for the chat that we're going to have today because it means that he understands brand from both the product side um, and from the internal and external teams. So I'm going to let Abhishek uh, do, do a bit of an introduction himself in a second. But before I do that, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. So the, uh, I've got my, my trusty timey timer, and I'm going to set that to, uh, to 45 minutes uh, that we're going to chat to and uh, chat for, and then uh, we'll open it up to, to questions from anyone that has, uh, that has them. Uh, you will have a uh, questions window, where I think it's one of the buttons down around here somewhere, where you can type those in. And we've got uh, uh, Scott and Francis working hard in the background. Uh, and they'll be surfacing those to, to shake an eye through the, through the session. Um, I am working out of the studio today. I do have a, a two-year-old and a five-year-old at home. So, <laughs> so uh, but in true lockdown fashion, it is, it is empty and uh, I'm, I'm quite safe and uh, not endangering anyone else at the same time. So today's, um, today's breakfast session is gonna be all about uh, bringing brand into product design and uh, Personally, I absolutely love Dropbox. I've been a fan of Dropbox for many years. I uh, used it uh, as a creative to share files whenever it was impossible to share files. And it still is pretty tricky. There's absolutely nothing easier than grabbing a file, putting it in your public folder, right-clicking and sharing. Uh, we have uh, uh, Google Docs and it is so much harder uh, to do it through Google Docs, which is mad to think that this, this far down the line, it's still that tricky. Um, but Dropbox has grown over the years to do so much more. It's become a much bigger brand, it's become better known, it's got so much more functionality and so much more that it can do. And along that way, the brand and the product has had to change. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And uh, I'm going to be talking about that with Abhishek. So Abhishek, do you want to give us a little bit of a, a background to yourself, your journey with Dropbox and uh, what where the journey that Dropbox itself has gone on over the last 12 years? Yeah, absolutely. Um, first of all, thanks again for having me. Uh, times are strange. Yeah, I'm, I'm sit in the corner of my flat in London. Um, you can see the bookshelf of all the books I could find in my house to make it look like I'm knowledgeable <laughs> and I read. Um, most of them aren't, aren't full. They're just veneers. Uh, yeah, so as, as Dave mentioned, I've been with Dropbox actually almost six years now. Uh, my anniversary is coming up in June for the sixth year. And Originally started in the San Francisco office. I was on a sales team trying to help people to see the value of using Dropbox at their businesses. And then moving out to London, jumped into more of a partnerships orientation, business development role, uh, working with key partnerships across just different verticals of business to try to make sure that um, wherever you were using Dropbox, we were there, or wherever you wanted to use us, we were there. Um, and the company's really evolved. In the time that I've been at Dropbox over six years, we went through major, major milestones. We didn't have company values when I started. We've rolled them out twice now. We went public as a company, which was really big. We really, really doubled down into a business format as well as a personal format. So as we've continued, we've definitely seen everything change and, and sort of evolve, grow up a little bit, as well as uh, adhere to maybe what the the space and what our software is allowing people to do. Yeah, and you've managed to keep your uh, your hair in check during uh, during lockdown. Have you been doing secret? I'm. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. I'm very lucky that my girlfriend uh, could cut hair, and she could do it better uh, than than I actually, to be honest with you, expected. I was really impressed. So I have a nice, you know, tight 
cut right now, but I don't think I'm going to ask her to do it again because I think it was a very stressful time for both of us. You see, I decided I was either going, I'm a man of extremes. I was either going to uh, shave it all off or I was going to let it go to this full lethal weapon style, uh, beautiful hair that it is right now. I'm going to fire a faucet bounce to it. But <laughs> you know, I, at this point, I don't think I'm going to do anything. I'm just going to let it see how far it can go. I was very tempted to do that. I was getting to that point. Unfortunately, the way that my hair grows, the back of it goes straight down and the top curls. So I go straight into a mullet very quickly. And given that I'm from Ohio in, in the US and it's kind of like a flyover state, I don't want to further that stereotype of having a mullet as well. So I decided against it. Hey, but think about it for your job, you know, party, party at the back and business at the front will be spot on. It would, it would. Yeah, yeah. How has lockdown been for you? Have you managed to do your job? Yeah, yeah, we, uh, we went to the work from home format before lockdown kicked off about two weeks before lockdown kicked off. So it was definitely a growing pain. We uh, have really great offices at Dropbox. We made sure that our employees are really, really well kitted out to be productive at the office. So when you're suddenly putting everybody at home, a lot of us didn't have spaces that were really meant for work. Um, I kept my flat really bare kind of minimum because I didn't want to bring my work home. I was trying to be able to differentiate the day. Um, and now I've had to completely revamp that. So lockdown has been a learning process there, but I think it's finally hit a point where I've gotten uh, the right sort of tools in place and the right, I guess, scheduling and routines and all. And I feel like I'm, I'm finally getting into a point where I can actually work a bit more efficiently. And I think my colleagues are getting there too. We're all just getting very used to it. However, everybody's sort of chomping at the bit to go back to the office. Yeah. Oh, so I was reading on the news today, it's so 45% of people in the UK have said that they want to retain a little bit of the life that they've, they've started to take on uh, during lockdown. I think there, there are definitely there are good sides and bad sides to it and everyone's having a different experience. I mean, I, you know, I think I, I'm ridiculously fortunate, you know, kind of um, managed to, to keep working and to look after the family and, and we're lucky enough to have some outdoor space as well. But with a two and a five year old, two little girls, they just don't, they don't understand that daddy's working, you know, yeah. which is, you know, it's, it's lovely for me because between meetings I get hugs, but you're, uh, you're, you're like a lot of people right now balancing. Uh, doing that. Yeah, I'm very, I'm very fortunate um, that it's been a very distraction sort of free working zone, but I, I do feel for caretakers who have just kids running around. My sisters both have small children and it's just really hard to get work done. So I fully think that when the time comes back, we're going to be in some sort of like hybrid model that we just have to be in. And I think we were always afforded that at Dropbox, but it was sort of like an unwritten rule. And then it will just now have to become a written rule. This is, you know, take two, two days, three days at home, whatever you need. If the commute looks terrible in San Francisco or London or wherever you are, then just, pop into the workstation that we helped you get set up when quarantine happened and just get going there. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Right, I'm gonna jump into some uh, some questions for you. So uh, I guess the first thing is your Dropbox is used in a lot of different ways for different people. How, how, would you, how would you want the customers to describe it? Yeah, that's a, that was an evolving answer for many years. Currently, the way we'd want our customers to describe us is, uh, sort of a smart workspace or a collaborative workstation, if you will. So gone are the days that it's just a folder, you drop things in and that gets you all of the files that you need wherever you're going to be and I'm sure you can share it to other people and that's kind of nice. And now we want to come to lean on that collaboration aspect of things and how uh, organizing your thoughts, organizing projects, or organizing the shares that you're going to have, um, the, the documentation that's around the files that you're creating. Um, so the design guide that goes alongside the really big uh, piece of work that you've just gotten done is sort of where we'd like to go. So the, the, the words are smart workspace. What that means is come here. We'll try to integrate to as many things as we can so that you can get your work done over there as well. But ultimately, the foundational layer will be that file system of Dropbox that's going to sit across all those software pieces that you have. Yeah. Um, and then... You know, it has gone through a bit of a journey. I remember, I remember reading a story once one time. I don't know if it's true about um, Apple trying to buy it and, and Steve Jobs and Riot because he, uh, he, he he couldn't uh, he couldn't buy Dropbox. 
and then you've gone, you know, from that, as you say, the, the folder that, you know, that magic folder sitting on your desktop uh, through to something which is so much richer and involves creative collaboration. And the, the visual brand then was relaunched about two years ago. Um, and I think whenever it came out, it was probably a bit of a shock to many because it was so different from a lot of the, the online storage or collaboration tools that were out there. Um, it, you had you know, colors that were purposely vibrating against each other and kind of uh, shot and cuts of different, collabor or different art styles and almost none of the, uh, the sort of visual tropes that you would expect from uh, an online piece of software, you know, photographs of people smiling, uh, writing on a screen, mm -hmm. yeah, or, or quite twee illustration. It was quite violent and, and uh, quite out there creatively, uh, attention grabbing as well. And I, I personally, I loved it, but I know that there was, there was a bit of back and forth uh, uh, in, in the industry, people having a view on it. And you know, when a brand relaunches, you want people to have a view on it. But I also thought, so I'd like to know a little bit just about how, what it was like whenever that launched, uh, but primarily internally, because um, at the end of the day, you're making a software product and it's something which is UX led. And um, UX, of course, means that we, we need to know how to use it. It needs to be familiar. So it's almost at odds with this quite um, uh, disruptive visual brand. Mm -hmm. So just wondering if you could give us a little bit of, you know, what yeah. like that time. Yeah. Um, the original Dropbox logo was one that had lived in the Internet's ethos for about 10 years at that point. Uh, I think everybody was used to the blue box and... I think the small bits of the software that maybe folks hadn't noticed were always a bit quirky. So the story was that we had a share button. The designer at the time, who was the first designer of Dropbox, had no idea what to make a share button look like besides the word share, because he's like, what icon means share? So he made a rainbow and it was a rainbow until about 2015 or something like that. Um, just because he's like, it's nice and it works. Um, we had like, four or four screens that were just really ridiculous things that we wanted to do, like a bald eagle riding a velociraptor, riding a great white shark. Like that was one of the um, four or four errors. So overall the, the brand was pretty childish in a way because it was enjoyable, but it was a hidden version of that. It was things you would know if you were getting into the weeds of it. If you wanted to pay attention, you could find it. But Ultimately, it was just very, very simple, very clean, very plain, a light blue and a white and some gray and some black and call it a day. So internally, when we heard the brand refresh was happening, we were all very curious as to like what they would do. Because if you've seen brand refreshes in the past, like Uber has gone through a couple now. Um, Slack got rid of the hashtag symbol and now has their new glyph. We thought we might be going into a really, really violent direction, uh, which really concerned a lot of us because ultimately that box that sort of glyph, if you will, was really recognizable and something that we really enjoyed having as company, um, as employees. So when we got the new glyph to start, everybody saw it and thought, okay, cool, that, that makes sense. It seems more symmetrical. And then one eagle-eyed internet user realized that it looked a lot like Argyle Socks. And so he created a fake website called Drop Socks um, to sort of poke fun at the idea that we had created a sock brand, uh, which we loved. And we actually went and created some socks and sent it to him and said, hey, thanks for the idea. Um, so you can get drop socks uh, from like going to some events sometimes whenever we can go back to events as like a little company swag there. Um, but the, the colors are really interesting because we, we oftentimes really struggled with that uh, in the early stages because you didn't want to show a white paper to somebody that had like purple and orange on it. It didn't seem very enterprisey or you were a little concerned that pink was suddenly like the backdrop of the slides that you were presenting with green font. Um, but what's interesting is I think no matter what happens, everybody's going to have an opinion ultimately. Like there's no way you're going to do a brand refresh and you're a big enough brand that people won't have some sort of thoughts on that. But what I found really fascinating was the, the color palettes that we ended up choosing had so much flexibility from the light blue and the black and the gray, which very, very clearly said one story. Suddenly we could tell multiple stories with the same brand colors and the same glyph so that a purple Dropbox logo and a blue Dropbox logo and an orange Dropbox logo could all be very, very distinct in the way that they're being um, displayed to the user. So depending on what we're trying to tell you, 
we could co-opt that sort of color as our product evolved because at the time it was all about creative energy um, and making sure that we were trying to enforce the ability of people to get things done creatively uh, we could take those colors and sort of morph alongside the product morphing to the smart workspace so that now your smart workspace has the right sort of hex code color if you will that makes you feel like that's what you need to be doing and when you go to our blog it's very animated it's very involved but those colors are still very stark no, that's cool. I love, I love the, the two sides of that. On one is that representation of something too simple being used to do a, a million different things, the, the, the creative possibilities. So a blank piece of paper is relatively dry until, you, until it's what you do with it that makes it interesting. But also from a UX standpoint, that idea that you have this, this sliding scale, you know, when somebody starts using it, it, it seems very stripped back and, and easy to use, but the more your relationship grows with it, the more the brand starts to come through, whether that's a 404 message. Or, mm -hmm. um, also that idea that, you know, if you think about any any company that's in a in quite a crowded marketplace that stands out, they kind of have to be a little bit opposed to the norm. You know, whenever Apple first started, it had to be opposed to IBM, Big Blue, and then later, later Microsoft. You know, so that, that creative space is an interesting place to be. But I wonder whenever you have a brand which is about being very creative and accessible and human, you know, words like that, you're at the same time, you're, you're dealing with people's secure files. Now, um, and I know that uh, from the, the attendees that there's quite a few people from banking on uh, the, the, the call, you know, that that's, they, that's something that they need to struggle with an awful lot. So I guess the question is, how do you, how do you balance customer trust? How do you, how do you deal with a business which, um, for which security has to be at the heart of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. It it can re it can be forgotten in the playfulness of any brand, from us to Zoom to Slack, uh, and it jumps up out in the news really quickly because it's one of those things that is a table stake of, you know, any software. All of those major um, incidents that we've had in the internet these days have all been really, really um, newsworthy and and title grabbing. Um, in our in our space of being folks with a lot of files you know us and the competitors of dropbox it has to be a secure place and it's one of the values that we actually hold really dear which is be worthy of trust so people are putting their intimate photos with their family on vacation their you know deep deep deeply involved personal work their uh you know collaborative team white papers or presentations or financial documents, or whatever in Dropbox. So it's really important that the system can rely, be reliable and those people can rely on us to keep it all safe and secure. So from the perspective of all the backend stuff, you know, getting into the weeds of that's not particularly exciting, but making sure that we're aligned with what the industry standards are, as well as pushing that industry standard and making sure that our engineers have a say when it comes to the analysts as to what is important from a security perspective um, and comparing that to the other big players. The thing that we've done as well, which I think is really great on the business side, because it's really where that security comes into play a lot more, is taking a bit more of a thought leadership approach about what security looks like on the business side. So mm -hmm. this doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't apply to personal users, but it's always you know, the, the hot button issue for a lot of IT DMs or IT decision makers. But understanding things like password protections and multi-factor authentications and complexity of those passwords with like the levels of entropy that you can have with the more characters that you're using and so on have really made a big sharp change in the level of uh, knowledge that our customers have when it comes to being secure um, and knowing what it is to be secure. So I always like to tell the example that when we rolled out a product that I was selling as a, at the time as a salesperson. Um, we had in Dropbox internally switched our two-factor authentication off of text messaging into uh, Duo Mobile, just a mobile app version of that. And uh, you know, YubiKeys and token keys and all that stuff were, were in our conversation. And then in our product, we still had that multi-factor authentication based on text messages. And it was sort of buried that you could do other versions. It wasn't you know, priority to you. It was just something that was there. Now, as soon as you get into a multi-factor authentication with text messages, you're doing a lot more for a user. They're getting a lot more secure, but it still has, you know, 
back channels of entry through people being really nefarious. And we just talked to our security team and said, hey, since we as a company have this concept of being able to do other things besides what we present to our customers as, as option one, shouldn't we just present to our customers a better option one and give them the option two, which is the lesser of the two? And they're like, that's a great point. A good reason for us to, to think that we want to be worthy of trust is to also uh, practice what we preach and then preach that as well a bit, a bit louder. So we switched it up so that, you know, to enable your sort of duo or Microsoft Authenticator, Google Authenticator for Dropbox is much faster. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also much more prominent than it used to be. And that's just a very simple way of saying, not only are we going to be here for a collaboration hub, but we're also going to be a secure version of that. So there's a little bit of uh, trusting that the audience will, will, will understand, be able to make a decision themselves. Yeah. Which, it, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, carry on your phone. Oh, I, was, I was just going to say it's, it's a conversation that will fall on deaf ears plenty. You know, when I go home and I talk to my, my mother about her password uh, uses, I know for a fact we're reusing a bunch of stuff and I need to you know, get in there and talk to her about good hygiene there. Um, so it's, it's tough to tell everybody to do everything, but it doesn't mean we can't try. I'd rather say that we pushed and pushed and pushed and it didn't work rather than assuming it didn't work and then leaving some of those opportunities on the table as a result. Yeah, I think we have we have a strange relationship with um, internet security at the minute. You know, I think it's moved on so much in the last couple of years, where almost most people have a sense of what technology security means. Um, you see things like Zoom happening. You know, the Zoom bombing and Zoom immediately switching on. You know, and and, and fixing that, and everyone understanding that and accepting it and carrying on using Zoom. You know, it's not that long ago that Apple had the breach on iCloud and uh, everyone, you know, freaking out about it and, and understandably so. You know, it's very, very, um, it's a very sensitive subject. But, you know, it's, it's it kind of reminds me, of, you know, that whenever, whenever we, we first started to put money in a bank, the first banks we used were the, were the churches. You put money in the church because you had this trust that, uh, well, on one side, you weren't expecting that anyone who wanted to steal something would steal from a church, um, but also that there might be there, there's some um, some presence looking over it. We mm -hmm. we almost have to have that relationship with technology. It's like you, like you'd have to take a leap of faith, and we're seeing that with you know, things like Monzo um, and Starling over the 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 um, the lockdown period. There's been a huge uplift mm -hmm. in switching banks you know previously the the, the, the stat was that you were more likely to be particularly divorced than to switch your bank you know it's about every 16 17 years that people will switch a bank and i actually just got a, my text this morning from monzo saying that my switch from santander has happened today oh. so I, I i do i wonder whether um whether there has been um, that almost relationship with the with the church back in the day that we we are starting to get back into a state of trusting technology a little bit. Um, do you think is that happening because of governance or you know or, or that the bar is just being set in a new way or are people just bored of talking about <laughs> security and, and don't want to think about it anymore? It's a combination of things. I think if I'm honest, I think the average consumer doesn't consider security as a priority for them until something happens and then people are very quick to jump off i remember the product hip chat was a big pervasive product across so many companies for a while and then it had a massive breach and then you know we jumped off uber jumped off a bunch of people jumped off and then slack ended up just buying the customer base out of hip chat um so that happened 2016 or 2015 and it was a good example of us just kind of using what we thought was right but then as soon as security happens it was like no was zero trust zero tolerance policy um, I think in some ways we, we rely on the experts in the room to tell us what is important to us to look for. But in the example like Monzo's and Challenger Banks and, and Starling and N26 and so on across the world, the one big thing they did was a little bit of what that disruption of an Uber um, and a captain and all that did with taxis. And what they did was they took these old pretty... Uh, exhausted security measures that made it really difficult for you to like send 10 pounds to your mate uh, or made it really difficult for you to 
uh, just log in even because you had to memorize all these extra passcodes and use the technology in front of us that we were told was really good, which is, hey, we now have your fingerprint on file. We have your biometric features on file. Um, you have to do a couple extra multi-factor authentications with these text messages that'll come through. So allowing us to, to use what was now secure in that space to further the technology a little bit more. And that's why people have probably found it a little bit more exciting to use. That all being said, as soon as one of these challenger banks has anything that happens to them, I mean, they are treading on very thin ice here and they have to be very careful. As soon as something happens, it's going to be a really interesting public response to that because you'll have all the classic Centenders and Barclays and Lloyd saying, well, we told you so. But at the same time, how do you come back and how do you distance yourself from the one that might mess it up? You know, whatever one bank ends up, um, hopefully not, obviously, ends up doing something. So it all remains to be seen. But I, I have faith in that these companies are treating themselves like companies like Dropbox and Slack and Zoom and Google and so on are treating themselves, which is putting security at a forefront and not leaving it as an afterthought. So as you create any new feature and product, understanding the measures that need to make it secure and having that built into the process of, of building. And this is where the value of security really matters inside your product. So if you don't value security, it won't be in your product. And so as soon as you put that at the number one value, which is our number one value of Dropbox, then it has to be in our product. And that's a good way of calling someone out in a meeting saying, you know, have you thought about the trust of this particular thing that we're building? Yeah. And, and, and that comes back around full circle. I mean, if you, if you look at what's happened with uh, Facebook in the last year and their huge advertising gain, uh, campaigns to try and regain trust, um, they've, they've burnt their brand. You know, yeah. I certainly wouldn't trust Facebook. They were about to launch their own currency and yeah. had to pull back from it. Certainly in certain countries, they would pull back from it because the trust wasn't there anymore. Who on earth would trust Facebook with their money when you can't trust them with your, your personal data? Yet at the same time, they own WhatsApp and they own Instagram, and we've all moved on to them quite happily and are giving our data. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think to me, you know, that, that tells you the strength of brand. And it tells you the strength of brand and technology because the same company owns those three brands, yet we're burning one and, and moving to the other two. Mm -hmm. You know, whenever the underlying technology and sharing of data underneath is, is equally shared back to Facebook. So anyway. Yeah. I mean, not to harp on the Facebook thing more, but that's one of those things where the brand of Facebook, that word Facebook is starting to feel dirtier to the average consumer. Um, and so it's going to, I don't think you'll see Facebook acquisitions of big companies ever, you know, take over that particular brand. You know, Adobe is really good at taking brands in and switching them into Adobe uh, and making it seem like a very, very separate, a very, very, um, uh, internal type thing. So this is now the Adobe suite for whatever it is. They just purchased marketing or um, design or whatever it is, but Facebook doesn't have that luxury anymore. So we're going to stop seeing, you know, the Oculuses of the world will stay Oculus and WhatsApps and the Instagrams. They might have a buy Facebook underneath, but ultimately, yeah, I don't think we're ever going to see like Facebook messenger overtake WhatsApp, which was the rumor a couple of years ago where they were going to conflate all of it together. I think they found out that would have been a really good way to lose business. Like I certainly would have stopped using it if I had to use Facebook Messenger to do WhatsApp instead. And how, and how funny whenever it's, yeah, it's the same technology underneath. Um, okay, so we've we're, we're got 15 minutes left and I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch the, the topics and, and start talking about um, how you use the brand to make some of the product decisions internally in house. Um, for those that are, are uh, listening, Again, thank you for joining us this morning. Um, we are taking questions and I think we've, we've got about 11 questions so far. So there is a Q&A button at the bottom. Bash those in there. And uh, our, our wonderful assistant, Scott, is going, to, is going to tell us some of the questions to be answered um, in 15 minutes time. So um, I think I've worked in a lot of large organizations and, and a lot to, with a lot of different design and digital teams. And there's always this challenge of getting the brand and marketing team, which we've talked a little bit in the first half of this chat, who have a very strong idea of where the company wants to go and are presenting you know, the best fit forward for, for the business. And then you have the, the, the development and the design teams who have their backlog of stuff that they, they need to get through. Um, they have their product roadmap. 
um, and it's being led by lots of different uh, factors and functions. And then uh, very rarely do I see a strong tie between the vision of the company, the experience it wants to deliver and the design and marketing teams, that's still a thread that runs through it. So it's a very quite a broad question, but how do you practically get people who are working from different backgrounds to talk to each other and to, to work towards uh, the same goal? Yeah, I think it, at a, place like Dropbox, it definitely has to start at the top a little bit. And it's very important to anybody who's listening to this, that if you have the, I guess the power within the company to um, affect change from a top-down um, perspective, it's really important that that top-down perspective is not a siloed perspective. And by that, I mean, sure, having different business units is really important, different reporting structures, but making that cross-functional work part of your company's value and its norm is really important. So our engineering side, our product design side sits very, very, very intimately with our marketing side, our sales sides. They interact plenty. They talk about features. We have had conversations internally about at Dropbox about building a specific feature that seems really cool, that really, really fits well with the ethos of our product team, but it takes the sales side, it takes the diversity of thought there for someone to say that's not really going to turn, you know, much, it's not going to push much of the needle for us compared to this feature, which is actually much more important. The analogy I always like to use is when YouTube's app first came out for their phone, they found that 10% of their videos were upside down. And they were wondering why 10% of the videos were upside down until they realized that not one left-handed person had helped build the app and that left-handed people were all filming videos upside down because that's just the way they oriented their phone. Mm -hmm. So much in that vein, Dropbox wants to make sure that, you know, there's not just a bunch of right-handed developers who are building something, but that the left-handed sales team and left-handed customer facing teams can put in that insight and that input. So on our values, one of the values that's really important to us is just simply like making work human. And what that means is it's trying to remember that you know, while we sit in these tech companies that are based in these major cities across the world, there's a lot of people who don't think the way we do. Um, one great, you know, great statistic is that, you know, most people in San Francisco have an iPhone, but the majority of the world who uses Dropbox has Android. So it's important for us to build all the features that, su that sit across all those particular um, customers. And I think that's just how our product ends up evolving in the way that it does. It becomes very utilitarian in that sense because we have to keep it really simple. We have to make sure that our our functionality is not this like really distressing involved technology that takes an expert in some sort of mechanism of, of software to, to operate it. And um, just sort of keeping that in the back of our mind the whole time is really important. And how, how do you decide what happens next in the product backlog? So we have a couple of um, routes of doing this, but one of the routes that we actually do it is specifically tied to feedback from our sales and customer teams. And by customer teams, I mean also our um, customer service teams, as well as uh, the CSMs and the account managers and so on. So there's a, a mechanism that we built internally that basically takes a ton of information. It takes a subjective measure of how these features might align to our vision from what drew and from <clears throat> what our C-level staff has told us. It takes some objective measures of how many seats or how many actual users would be affected by this as well as just money um, as, as a full measure. And then it takes a final measure, which is really good, which I really like, which is based on a bunch of user research that we did, which was, hey, what are the jobs that people are trying to do with Dropbox? Like what are the actual tasks that you're trying to complete? We took that um, and formulated the scoring mechanism that we could apply to these new features and say, okay, we wanna build a feature that is tied to mobile. How important is mobile to our customers? Well, based on our uh, weighting of these scores, mobile is, is of X importance, but this feature also ties to sharing, so that's of X importance. Mm -hmm. And we come out to this really, really beautiful score, and we just plot that on a graph, and we see what looks up to the right, and if it's up to the right, we talk about it first. Nice. Yeah, it's a nice way of balancing what the, uh, the, the customer needs with uh, what's going to drive the company forward, the vision. I think there's, a, there's always this challenge. I'm an you know, absolutely huge proponent and, and uh, supporter of anything to do with uh, human-centered design, you know, and, and UX and CX. But in order to make that leapfrog, in order to make that jump, you, you have to 
go beyond just what the customer's asking you for. Um, and I don't mean that in you know, uh, 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 if I had listened to the customer, they would have wanted a faster horse. I don't mean that. I, I just yeah. mean, uh, you've got to balance the two. Mm -hmm. yeah, DX does not just mean make, uh, reducing clicks and, uh, and doing constant testing. You, you also have to do innovation at the same time. Yeah, like we wouldn't have an iPhone if people just responded exactly to what a customer wanted, but there was customer feedback from the world and the market that got us to a point where an iPhone was the right decision based on also that innovation. So it is important to to marry the two and not just respond exactly to what the, the field says. Because conversely, a lot of times if we had had a fully sales run product roadmap, we wouldn't build anything that didn't close immediate business. And therefore, our product would not be innovative at all. Yeah, or, or you'd be violently moving from left to right and then you'd never mm -hmm. put something long enough to make it usable. Um, which leads me on to actually, I know that you guys have been very successful over the year with hackathons as a way of driving new innovation. Um, and I think that also ties into that value you just mentioned, you know, of making work human. Um, you know, why, why do you use hackathons and, and how, how do you make the most of the, the, the human capital, the brain power that you have? Yeah. The hackathons are great because <clears throat> usually a hackathon would be like a day, maybe two. But I think in the early stages of Dropbox, in the first like 15 employees kind of stage, everybody was really burnt out from trying to keep this product um, growing as fast as it was growing. And that was at that viral growth stage where there was just a lot happening. So Drew and the rest of the team decided, let's just take a week and start cranking on really random and cool projects to see what we can put together. Even if you're, you know, code comes together with duct tape and bubble gum. Let's just see if that works. And that hackathon that we did first has just continuous repeated every year for a full week. Uh, once a year, we as a company will get together across every single discipline and think about what we want to do with a completely free week of time. And it's really fun to see what comes out of that. Actually, our, our product roadmap gets influenced like something like 30 to 40% or something like that from that one hack week because people really think so out of the box and they come up with just genius ideas. If you're using Dropbox right now, you might notice that, you know, really part and parcel feature within uh, us and any of our competitors is the idea that there's files on your desktop and some of them appear on your desktop, but then have like a little cloud symbol. So the actual bits are not on your desktop, but we've given you sort of a shell version of it that you can look at. And that was in a hack week project. That was one thing that came out entirely because somebody one day was like, what if we let you see your entire Dropbox on your desktop, but it's stored like minimal bytes at the time. And then if you look at uh, like simple, simple, simple features that are just so widely used, like a file request, it was because somebody who worked really closely with schools on the sales side said, hey, you know, teachers just want to get homework from students. Can we build like a request system? And that is now a feature that we have built into the product. So those, those hackathons really matter a lot. We call it Hack Week. It's really important as as far as our product goes, but I think most importantly, as, as far as our culture goes, so we all know that once a year for a week, we'll get to do something that's outside of our regular job and can really push us to, to feel, you know, something out of the box. Like I'll dust off some really crappy coding skills and take some sort of flow that I don't know how, how I do every day and it drives me crazy and try to automate it. So I have to do our, I, I choose to do our uh, debrief mod moderation. So whenever we interview people, we go through a panel process and there's a third party who does debriefs and sort of moderates it all. And I was manually creating documentation for it every time. So I automated it just because I had a week of work to like learn Python and try to do that. So ultimately as a value of the company goes, it's something that not everything's going to be on the product. Not everything's going to be, um, you know, the next big thing that Dropbox is going to market and sell and everybody's going to love, but it is an endeavor for you to think creatively and to try to push yourself to be as collaborative with other people around you. Cause if you're not technical, but you have a great idea, there's probably someone who wants to help you do it. Hell yeah. And that's, I mean, that, that make work more human as well as understanding that you have people in your organization that have skill sets that can bring value other than the seat that they're sitting in. I, I love Fact that you know you're dust, dusting off some Python skills and, and looking at all of them. Um, you know, similarly, you know you've, you've probably got designers in there who could solve one of the business problems. You know, putting those putting those briefs together and letting people go wild. Yeah, I mean, 
one of the one of the creative ones that I heard was just the finance team took the week and actually outlined every single tool that the finance team uses, put them down into like most layman's terms. There's no FPMA talk going on. There's no like heat maps or anything, blah, blah, blah. It's just, hey guys, here are all the tools we use. And then if you walked by their pod, you saw this big banner that said, here are all the things that finance does to get these like 10 processes done. And it was so eye opening and very enlightening. So everybody's curious at Dropbox. And we're also curious at the end that like, that's, that's all that goes into getting payroll done, you know? Yeah, and it's um, it's all part of one business. You, you're you're not you're different teams. I think talking about teams, it's going to be interesting um, how the world of work changes over the coming years. You know whether we do go back to everyone working in inside offices uh, and sitting together as teams, and obviously collaborative software and online cloud storage. That's right at the epicenter of this discussion. You know because that's the enabler. If the pandemic happened not that long ago, you know, 20 years ago, we wouldn't have been able to function the way that we are today. Wait, the pandemic did not happen 20 years ago? Because I kind of feel like I've been doing this for like 20 <laughs> years now. It's been, a, it's been an exhausting, <laughs> exhausting few months. It's kind of, it's kind of like Bill Murray in the Groundhog Day. I feel like it really is. Warm clock radio every single morning. That's a really good prank on anybody. If there's like someone that you're waking up to every day, just like set their alarm to the same Groundhog Day song every morning and see if they notice. <laughs> no, I'm a wife of trouble. Uh, <laughs> so wh where do you, well, two questions. Have you guys seen what Zoom saw where you, you know, your, your number of user base doubled overnight? Um, and what have you learned through this period that's going to, you're going to take in later on? Uh, and to you know, take further. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we released a blog post around the earnings that we had after, I think, Q1 and early into Q2, and we definitely saw an increase in demand. Like our trials of our business product were up 40%. Individual trials were up 25%. Um, Signups just were really highly impacted by by that. Um, you know, our, our desktop app had 60% increase in its new weekly users. and the Zoom integration from Dropbox had like a 20% increase and signature requests on our Hello Sign product were like 3X. So yeah, the numbers really juiced very quickly. I think it was um, a combination of things, but ultimately folks who were trying to make a decision on Dropbox prior to the pandemic made their decision much more quickly. And then other folks who were being exposed to it by, by you know, people like me who, if I worked at a different company, would still evangelize the product because it, it is so useful for me to get my work done that they just thought, okay, I'm just going to sign up and get this thing done because I can't really rely on them to email it to me anymore. Maybe my connection is not great or we just don't sit near each other. Um, so yeah, our numbers did increase quite a bit. The blog post is really interesting because it dives into a lot of the specifics of perhaps why without trying to be too... Um, prescriptive on it because we don't want to one we don't want to try to assume a lot of what people are thinking but we also have to you know treat this like scientists a little bit and say perhaps you know we saw that teams increase because they were looking for a way to deliver their products when they really had to get it done at the right time yeah and do you think is that is the business going to going to change well do you, do you think that your customer is going to change through this do you think that they've probably got more comfortable with some of the software or yeah I mean, Dave, you and I will will we'll call up some family member somewhere and we'll we'll say like, hey, I'll just we'll zoom you on the weekend or something. We'll use that verb that we probably wouldn't have used in February to talk about something. But now we know that the person on the other side, even if it's you know not very tech savvy, um, older friend of yours or something, can understand that. So I think we all suddenly got way more tech savvy really quickly. Um, and we're all diving into these things more quickly. So ultimately I hope that our customers are a little bit more comfortable with our software, but I also know that in the end, there's gonna be a lot of people who uh, had to learn just more things than they wanted to learn back in February. Um, so yeah, things like Zoom, like Slack, you know, we, we could even joke, we joked like, you know, I'll, I'll Zoom you on the weekend and then I'll maybe message my sister and say, I'm gonna like just do it through FaceTime. But like I use the word Zoom as though it's, Skype, what you, what Skype used to be, or like what Xerox is in, in the U.S. and stuff like that. Like we're just, it's it's now that term. So Dropbox isn't yet there, by the way. But um, you know, sending someone a Dropbox link is is turning into just that way of like, hey, I'm gonna share some files with you real quick. Yeah. Oh man, I've I've done some uh, 
some pretty cool things, some things that did work and some things that didn't work over, over the internet while we've been in lockdown. I did wine tasting. And, and that okay. Because the, while the, the smellier was talking, we were able to have little side chats and have uh, drunkenly make each other laugh. Um, I, did, I did a comedy gig last week. Nice. Which was a comedian, Andrew Maxwell, that I love, Irish comedian. Uh, it was 100 people, exactly the same technology we're using for this, but he was in your living room doing a comedy gig and he could see everyone. So it was actually was as nervous uh, as I would be going into a comedy gig and sitting in the front row, except it was on my, it was on my sofa. Really, really creepy. I watched the uh, I watched Three Car Named Desire, uh, the London Vic did. I had to say it didn't work. Uh, uh. I think because uh, Three Car Named Desire is it's a very shouty play. You know, there's there's a lot of it's pretty violent in parts, and then it's also a play, so all of the actors yeah. really project their voices. And then it's in your living room, so it was just a lot of people shouting for three hours. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't. You didn't get that. You know, being in the being in the middle of it in, in a in an environment in a in a, in a theater where you actually feel the the emotions that the the actors are portraying. You just kind of lost that. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Have you done anything? Yeah. I um yeah a couple of different things like obviously the multitude of Zoom chats that have happened uh, are are just the fact of life. Um, the big thing that I did. Uh, that I'm really proud of that I think is is a testament to just the scrappiness of, of who we are is um, in a previous life, I was a bartender, like a whatever mixologist is the word that people might use, which I think is a bit funny, but I uh, signed up on a, on a platform that my brother's friend had sent up in the U S which is, it's called let's hang in. And it's the idea that we'll do a bunch of stuff at home. So let's like set up different ways for us to do those things, cooking classes, whatever it is. And I started teaching bartending on that platform um and you 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 have a payment structure in the platform so people can pay to join a class if you're doing a scheduled class but i treat it very like um bespoke an individual so you bring together a group of people and you sign up through this app for me and um you know six people eight people ten people whatever it is uh whatever you give to me i'm going to take back and i'm going to donate to the cause of that particular moment which given our lockdown experience the first two that i did i donated into COVID 19 causes to try to you know help people who are trying to to benefit the world society uh, the next one i have will be going towards the black lives matter movement that uh, is really important and really really top of mind right now and um, i'm doing this all just with the sense of i have some free time i have a pretty stocked bar at home i have a weird amount of knowledge in my head when it comes to drinks so let me just um, teach everybody how to make some cocktails at home so that when you're scrambling around on the next Friday and you're like, oh, what can I drink? You actually have some stuff in your head and maybe some kit that you went out and purchased for it. Dude, I'm so down for that. I'm a, I'm a son of a publican. My dad, my dad ran, a, ran a bar ah. group, a bar, um, but my, my skills need uh, need topped up as well as my, uh, my drinks cabinet. All right, that, that's, uh, we've got uh, about 12 minutes. I'm gonna hop into, into some of the, the, the questions. Um, okay. Yeah, um, so uh, one from uh, Dave Brecken. It feels like we're coming to a time when the lines between creatives, marketing, and tech are having to cross. How does Dropbox ensure everyone is on the same page? So what are the more practical ways that they communicate cross team? Yeah, we are a very, very um, distinctly collaborative group. We, we have tons and tons of documentation, but we do it all in the, the paper product that Dropbox has. It's not the most used product of Dropbox, but it's probably one of my most used products. I think the majority of my work and, and a lot of Dropboxers go into there. So when it comes to anything that we're doing, it has to be done in paper. It has to be done in a way that can be easily accessible, easily readable, easily commentable, and, and easily editable. So those factors make it so anything that we do has to be um, you know, thoughtful for the individuals who aren't the ones who are writing it up. There's never a really closed box scenario. Someone's made a PowerPoint deck, you have to go search for it kind of thing. It's much more open. Um, like, as a company, there's very few private paper documents. There are private paper documents, there have to be. There's just the nature of the world that we're in today and the, the sensitivity of some information. But, you know, when I build out my next partnership that I'm going to work on, that paper doc is accessible to Drew if he wants to go and take a look at, you know, what are we going to do with that particular brand? Like, why are we partnering with, um, you know, 
bricks in the U S or something like that. And he can dive into that and learn. So that really helps because when then it comes time for me to roll up a new creative person um, to, to get involved, they have all of our information just sat right there. Yeah. I think just for those listening, uh, whenever you say paper, you're talking about the Dropbox paper, the, the Dropbox paper. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you, do you know, do the design teams or the product team, do they have principles in place? Do they have, you know, aside from just the brand guidelines, do they have things that they do and don't do um, yeah. And yeah. for the, for the design process? Yeah. Yeah. There are definitely rules of the road that we follow. Um, they're not so hard and fast as to get mad at you if you come to them for the first time and don't know all the rules of the road, which is a, a good way of saying people are generally just friendly about the way that they work. But yeah, there are some, some distinct rules of the road on how they're going to work on these things and what they're going to work on and what is on a different team or what is their team. Um, in the end, it's all, I mean, we're all out here just at this point, especially just trying to function. But even when we're all in an office together, we are just trying to function because you will spend an enormous amount of time with the 30 people in your in your network in your sphere of work but as soon as you need to find that 31st person you're suddenly in really really uncharted territory so as a company we take the tact of you are very 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 highly encouraged to ask for help and you are very very highly discouraged from being like oh I, that's not my thing it's it's better that i show you how to get to where you're going with directions and tell you you're barking up the wrong tree uh, Lindsay Brownlow asks, how does Dropbox consider and work through B2B and B2C offerings and strategies? Um, are you truly B2B to C? And uh, is there a different experience for, the, for each? B2B to C. Yeah, I should use that one. That's a good one to confuse everybody because it takes you a second. You have to read it. Um, thanks for the question, Lindsay. Uh, yeah, we... We do treat them pretty separately, but ultimately that underlying product is not that different. We understand that the reason Dropbox got to the point that it was, was because that user, that that UX was so easy that people saw our product and were like, okay, this is a simple enough strategy. The the content that I want to get to where it needs to go is going to be done in this sort of mechanism. So if we made a business product that was really distinct from the personal product, as soon as you got onboarded, you'd be like, what on earth am I supposed to be doing with this? Because it's not Dropbox that I know. So ultimately that really B2B to C idea is, is not un, it's not incorrect. It's make a product that people can use. And then for the B2B part of that, make sure that the IT DM who is going to look at it has all the tools and the, the levers and the switches they need. How do I turn off external sharing if I need to do that? How do I set up multi-factor for my entire company? How do I enforce really strong passwords that get reset every certain amount of time? How do I turn off the sessions and how do I set up team structures? That kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, when it comes to you and I collaborating on something, it has to be as simple and straightforward as possible. We will enable our business customers and our paying consumer customers with some new features because that's just the nature of software. You get a free product, but then there's some other great stuff you can pay for. Um, But the user experiences aren't going to be that dissimilar. So if you go and purchase a Plus or a Pro account, you won't find it to be greatly different than a business account. But unless you know what you're looking for, you'll find the subtle differences there. Yeah, cool. Uh, the, uh, the wicked smart Chris Burgess, I know. Hi, Chris. This is uh, a question. So does Dropbox focus more on qualitative or quantitative data uh, when it's setting direction for product design? It is very very common uh, combined it is it is a a like a weird slurry of both of those things so on the qualitative side we have to understand on a, and like like i said before the subjective measures of what we're trying to do as a brand how we think we're gonna be able to turn the market or change it in our best interest and what people will say and think about these changes but then on the quantitative side you have to be able to back it up you know, we announced this great partnership with Better Cloud uh, as a business product partnership last year. Um, my colleague uh, Steve had done that particular partnership, and from a quality, from a quantitative state, if you were to compare the amount of work that Better Cloud was doing on our business side to, let's say, like the amount of personal accounts that we have, it didn't seem like a lot. But as soon as you looked at the right subset of data, you'd understand, okay, the, the problems that they're solving would hit these particular marks for us that we've been measuring against. And then we can actually say like, this is the sort of 
uh, N population that would be affected by these changes that we'd think were really positive. But so then on the qualitative side, we would look at that, we'd actually understand what would a benefit of a partnership like that look like? What would we get as a company from brand perception? How can we make that decision work more holistically? If you don't have one, the other one won't matter quite as much. You can maybe still make that decision, but I can tell you at Dropbox, we would rarely ever make a decision without both of those things. If you gave me a beautifully awesome, cool idea that had zero backing, how am I gonna get the resources to do that if you don't have numbers that give me some information? And similarly, if you show me a bunch of numbers that say like, hey, quantitatively, this is kind of important. Uh, if you don't tell me how that's going to be important and, and understand who it's going to affect and why and what the perception of that'll be, it's not going to really move the needle much. Yeah, that makes sense. So we're, we're, we're running the, and to our last five minutes. I have tons of other great questions there, but um, thank you for everyone that has put them forward. We're, um, I just wanted to sort of end with uh, if there are any books, that, what's your favorite books that you're reading at the minute or favorite podcasts? And special mention, uh, you can tell us a little bit about your own podcast. Yeah, oh gosh. Um, well, on the books front, the current, uh, the current two books that I have, one is A Guilty Pleasure, one is uh, a more of an endeavor. So The Guilty Pleasure is I've never read the Philip Pullman novel novels before. They weren't really that big in the U.S. when I was growing up, so I, I was told, "Hey, just finish these three books." So I'm on the final, like, thirty pages of the um, Amber Spyglass book, which has just been like a put you to bed kind of reading for me. Um, see, you see adoption? HBO. I haven't. I haven't. Definitely read the books first, but it's it's so good, so choice. Okay, good to know. I know that they had that Golden Compass movie, and I'm happy that I didn't watch that. <laughs> um, the other one is a personal project of mine. So I, without getting too, too deep into my personal life, I um, have always found this fascination with Buddhism as a religion, as a, as a mindset, as well as just a philosophy. So I've taken upon myself to actually purchase like a pretty small intro to Buddhism textbook that, that I used to study back in college. And I'm kind of rereading it and understanding it and, and formulating my thoughts around it as a human being, because I find that it fits a lot of my philosophy as well. Um, so those are the two things that I'm on right now. The next book that I will read is, um, I think it's called How to Be Right. Uh, and it's a very fascinating book. Yeah, right up here, actually. Um, I'll have to find it. Um, it was recommended to me by my girlfriend, but it's a really, really clever book about the current uh, strangeness of our conversations these days, the alternative facts and the fake news and so on. Um, the the opinions that people have that are tied to things like Brexit and what they are emotionally actually about versus what they are um, saying out loud and what the actual policy is. So, you know, the way that I've understood this book is it's a way of understanding a bit of a, a, a comedic side of, of the differences of our statements as, as people. And I think it's really important, especially for, you know, all the stuff that's going on around the world with regards to Black Lives Matter and that whole um, movement at the moment. It's, it's understanding what people are saying uh, on both sides of that coin. On podcasts, um, quick shout out to my own podcast that I host. It's called One Simple Question. Um, I don't know if you guys can see this, but I have like one of my podcast mics here as my way of speaking to you all today because I thought, why not? Um, so I host a podcast that is just around finding really, really cool and interesting people in the world, asking them a very simple question and diving deep into their answer uh, rather than asking them a series of uh, surface level questions. I take one and I kind of keep going down the path of that until our conversation gets to a really unique point. Uh, one of my colleagues named Shamil Turner has a, a father who's an, a police officer in the U.S. and he's a black man who lives in Harlem, New York. So that is one uh, episode if you're going to listen, I'd really highly recommend listening to because he has a beautiful insight and it's really topical for today. Uh, I really, really, really love Against the Rules by Michael Lewis. I recommend everybody give that a listen. It's beautiful about just the world that we have today and and how the rules of the road and the social contract that we have as society is not really easily followed because the haves and the have nots don't have the same sort of capabilities. Um, revisionist history is coming back, which is really, really wonderful. And then a guilty pleasure of mine as well is called Dissect, which just dives into music song by song, um, including some of my favorite artists like Frank Ocean, Kendrick Lamar, Tyler, the creator, and so on. So those are some of my guilty pleasure podcasts. And then if you're really, really intense like me when I was training for a marathon, hardcore history, four hour long episodes about uh, the Japanese World War II endeavors. It, it's, it's really awesome, but like you really need to be able to turn it on and just like turn your brain off. 
Yeah. Jake, it's lovely chatting to you. I'm glad, glad I've got to uh, allow other people into, into one of our chats. But um, our time is up, I'm afraid. Hopefully, oh, it's too bad. Hopefully everyone enjoyed that. And uh, of course, if you've got any questions, um, I can always ping them on to Sheik and I'm sure you can connect with them on LinkedIn as well. But uh, just to say thank you very much, uh, Sheik, for- Thanks for having me. I really I love it. I love chatting with you. It's always great. It's, it's interesting to have other people listen to our conversation this time. Because um, <laughs> in this format, I can't see them. So it just seems like we're just chatting. Um, no, this is great. Uh, we talked for about half an hour about hip hop before we- you know, <laughs> We will. We will. We will. We will. Um, yeah. I mean, thank you for this. This has been wonderful as always. And, and I hope that I was somewhat insightful. If not insightful, then I just kept you awake alongside your morning coffee. Hey, for, for our first uh, ever uh, breakfast session, I think that was an absolute stunker to start with. And if uh, anybody has any feedback, please, please, please let us know because it's our first and we, we love to learn. So Sheikh, I'll let you get on with your day and everyone else. Thank you so much. And uh, good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Nick.